A very warm welcome to the Cricket Library podcast. My name is Matt Ellis and today we get to hear another story that will hopefully inspire a love of cricket. The son of Bacchus, Dan Marsh. A distinguished first class career in his own right. We're going to hear his journey, where it all began, watching his dad play at the WACA. Heading from South Australia to Tasmania captaining Tassie to a Sheffield Shield final victory, the first person to do so. We'll hear a little bit about Mark Taylor's bowling as well. We'll ask him about captaincy, dealing with injuries, transitioning out of the game into his current role as a coach. And of course, we will not let him slip by without revealing his three people he would most like to invite to the Nets. So it's time to sit back, relax and enjoy our chat with Dan Marsh. It's a very warm welcome to the Cricket Library podcast. Dan Marsh, thanks so much for joining us. No, thanks very much for having me. Always good to take a trip down memory lane with the cricketers that have paved the way and uh, made a bit of a career for themselves, and that's something that, that you did. But your love of cricket, where did that all start for you? Do you have any early memories of of playing and loving cricket as a youngster? I certainly do, yeah. Um, you know, we grew up um, probably at the Wacker uh, watching Dad play. So um, we'd go to the Wacker to watch him play, but we'd end up playing cricket ourselves all day, and um, that's probably where the, the love for it started. Um, in terms of in terms of playing cricket um, in, in you know, any formal competition, that probably didn't happen until I was about 12, but... We always play backyard cricket, and like probably most most kids in Australia did back then. And um, yeah, just that's where, where it started, I guess, the love of the game there. And you mentioned your dad; he obviously had a a magnificent career for Australia, both on the field as a wicket keeper, and then later the impact he's had on the game as a coach. What was it like having a dad that had a significant profile in the game of cricket? Um, which it's a hard one because we don't, the only thing I've ever known, I guess, is, you know, when we, you know, we'd go out and for dinner or lunch or whatever, there'd always be people coming out and saying good day. But, uh, I, I guess what I loved about it, um, you know, when, when dad was at home, cause he was away a lot, um, you know, when we were little, uh, but when he was at home, he was at home with us. So we got to spend a lot of time with him, um, in that regard. So, you know, he, he, you know, I, I love watching him play cricket. I still remember, um, you know, the, some of the games when I was, when I was a little bit older, um, loved going to the ground. Um, and then obviously loved doing a bit of work with him, you know, as a player a bit later on. But, um, you know, it, it was, it's an amazing environment for a kid to grow up in. Uh, we used to go away to the, the you know, the Melbourne Sydney test matches every year. Um, you know, and, and got to spend some time with some pretty cool people. Yeah, it sounds sounds like a, a dream uh, for, for a lot of kids out there to have, have that sort of connection. And you mentioned going to the Wacker to watch Dad play. Um, it sounds like you were just immersed in the game and no surprise that you ended up playing it at a serious level yourself. Do you, do you remember much about you when you kind of realised I'm a chance of... Um, following in my dad's footsteps here and, and playing first class cricket? Um, not really. I guess for me once I started playing cricket, I mean I played cricket and footy and golf and tennis and played lots of different sports. So you know, as um, a lot of kids would have, they would have tried everything and I certainly love cricket and cricket season, I love footy and footy footy season. But um, you know, I think for me with the cricket stuff it was um you know, I was playing under 15s and under 17s, and I got picked in fourth grade. And then my my goal was to get picked in third grade, and then second grade, and first grade. I guess that was, you know, I didn't really have a dream to to play at the highest level as such, but I just wanted to keep going up through the grades. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't quite get to to play for Australia, but um, you know, I, I probably got the most out of myself. I would have thought by, by getting to sort of the the Sheffield Shield level and, you know, domestic first-class cricket. And did you always bowl your left-hand spinners and 
and bad a bit. Did you have something that you you had a preference of as you were coming through, kind of progressing through the grades? Uh, I was I was definitely more of a batter, but um, I think when I was thirteen or fourteen, I was bowling left arm medium pace, um, not very tall, and Dad convinced me that I should try bowling spin. So you know, I took it up. Um, you know, and and it's a great you know thing to have in your in your game. You know, as a batter, to be able to bowl some overs as well. Um, you know, it, it made the day even more enjoyable. So yeah, you know, as I just you know, I worked on that. I worked on, you know, what worked for me from a spin bowling perspective. I wasn't a big turner of the ball, but became quite accurate and obviously got some overs um, and enjoyed obviously being in the contest. Um, but, yeah, definitely I see myself, I saw myself as more of a batter. Yeah, yeah. And um, when did you break into first-class cricket. Can you tell us a little bit about how that happened? You, you said you sort of wanted to go through the grades and worked your way up one at a time. When did the time come when you were sort of knocking on the door down there at South Australia? Yeah, so we, we moved from Perth to, to Adelaide when I was 17. Um, I started playing club cricket with Sturt there. Um, you know, and had probably 18 months or maybe two years of that um, and was going quite well. Um, in first grade, then got selected uh, for the second 11, South Australian second 11, and played some games there. And then I think it was yeah, it was December the 31st, so New Year's Eve, um, got selected to play against New South Wales, um, who I think Steve Wall was coming back from injury. He definitely played in that game. Michael Bevan. Um, and one of the things I look back at now is the first two days of that game, so December the 31st and January the 1st, there was 8,000 people there each day at a oh, Shield game. Which, wow. Um, yeah, like it was, they used to get good crowds in South Australia, but they were the two, two of the, well, the two biggest Shield crowds that I'd ever played under, and, you know, they were my first game. So uh, it was it was a really good, you know, great experience for me playing up, up against, you know, the people that you idolise. So, you know, I played with Darren Lehman and Greg Blewett, um, you know, I'm not sure who else was bowling. Gillespie wasn't quite in the team then, but yeah, some really good names in South Australian cricket at the time. Um, yeah, it was it was a good game. I think we actually lost the game. Um, we got bowled out cheaply in the second innings, but uh, it was yeah, it was a pretty good experience. And, and you're relatively young. You you a young man in a in a man's world, so to speak. Um, was was first class cricket back then? Uh, a lot tougher than first grade. Did you notice a distinct distinguishing difference between playing for Sturt and then you put your red cap on for South Australia? Was it a tougher brand of cricket? Yeah, I think so. I think you know there's some some hard um, cricketers playing at that level. Uh, one of the things I found, you know, probably not at the start, but um, as I got more comfortable at the level, was just the the standard of pitches was so much better at, at times it felt easier to bat on yeah um than your club wickets with not much pace on the ball um yeah so I, I always used to struggle going back once I settled you know I was playing the first class cricket I'll struggle going back to club cricket to get runs because just the pace <laughs> came off the ball and the wickets started doing a bit more yeah um but yeah but, you know it's definitely a, a tough competition Victoria particularly Strong Queensland, particularly strong at that state. New South Wales, I mean, all, all the states were very strong, um, and they're always hard fought contests. Um, you know, and obviously there's a lot being said out there, which has probably gone out of the game a bit, but all that was pretty enjoyable. And when did you decide to make the move to Tasmania? How did that come about? Was that something that you pursued, or something that? Um, you had someone contact you to say, how about you, you you come down and give cricket a try down there? Yeah. Um, Greg Shepard um, was the coach of Tasmania um, at the time. And I was, um, you know, I played a few games for South Australia. And then Tim May came back out of the Australian team. So that sort of spot as the second spinner slash all-rounder um, in the team was, you know, Tim May would come in and Peter McIntyre and Tim May were bowling together. So there wasn't a spot for me in the South Australian team. I played a bit of one-day cricket at the time, but um, Greg sort of made an approach where I'd be interested. Um, I think that was in the 95-96 season, and I 
sort of knocked him back. I was thinking that I could break through into the South Australian team and then over the next 12 months, I didn't play much cricket at all South Australia that year. Um, and he rang again and I said, right, I'll, I'm going to give this a go. So that that was the move. Um, it was the best move I made. I th- I'm not sure whether I would have you know, kicked on in South Australia, but just to be given the opportunity and the backing um, from Greg, obviously, um, and it took me a bit of time to settle in the in the Tassie team, but once I did um, and felt comfortable at that level, I um, started to put in some good performances. And, and do you enjoy the lifestyle in Tasmania? I, I spoke to Mark Atkinson oh, a fair few years ago now. He, he sort of said the, the lifestyle down there, there was good, uh, good for cricket and good a good environment to be around? Yeah, I loved it from the get-go. It's like, you know, you, you're moving away from home and um, you're going to a foreign place where you're meeting new people, but you're doing the thing that you want to do. So you want to be playing first-class cricket. And I was getting, you know, picked in every game um, at that stage. So for me, it was very enjoyable. I enjoyed, you know, I enjoy the winters here. I think they're really, they can get cold, but they're quite mild. Um, you know, I just threw myself I found a golf course down here that I, I went and played at, so I'm still a member at. So I, I just threw myself into Tassie life. Um, and then, um, my then wife, well, my now wife, um, she came down from South Australia after the first year and we've, you know, we settled in Tassie and we've got a family here. So, you know, we're really happy here and love the lifestyle. And, and cricket-wise, you, your cricket does start to blossom and you start to, to get noticed. You be, as you mentioned, you're getting getting regular game time there in Tassie. And you, you get the call-up for the PM's 11 game, 98-99. And it's against England, um, a great chance to show off your skills. The PM's 11 lose the game, but your man of the match was 74. What are your recollections of, of that experience of getting to play against England? Uh, yeah, it's a pretty cool experience. I was lucky enough um, when I was at the Cricket Academy, we played England a few times as well. So I played against a few of those guys previously. Um, but yeah, just remember we were at Monica Oval and as you know, the traditional PMs game, didn't really know what to expect. It was pretty, pretty cool sort of um, experience. Mark Taylor was the captain. Um, I think he, he didn't come out he didn't open the batting in the, the second inning because he was in having lunch with the PM, so he <laughs> batted in the order. Um, yeah, it was, you know, I think we trained the day before, so I'm, I'm pretty sure Alan Border might have been the coach. Yeah. Um, as well, you know, just some, you know, good young talent to be to be involved with. It was just a really, really cool experience, and it was nice to get a few runs on the day. Yeah, some runs on the day, and England, England win by 16 runs, and... The interesting takeaway I take from this is is the man who was having lunch with the Prime Minister uh, also, <laughs> in his wisdom, decided to have a bowl and he bowled one over for 16. Could that have been the difference between a, a win and a loss? Well, you never know, but potentially. I think <laughs> one of the things he did in that game, and I, I, he bowled Angus Fraser, I think, with a double bouncer, <laughs> the, ball bounced, the ball bounced twice, and it was called a no ball. So he, he actually didn't get away with it. But um, I guess that's how Audrey's right arm off in bowling was. Um, but I think just he, he probably gave himself a bowl. I think it was the last over or the second last over. So just to get the crowd going a bit, um, you know, it was it was a, it was a good laugh. Yeah, always always good when the skipper uh, rolls the arm over, particularly particularly someone like a Mark Taylor who we didn't get to see bowl a lot. Now, uh, you spent some time playing with Leicestershire. Can you tell us a bit about how that came about and and, and your recollections of, of your time playing first-class cricket in England? Yeah, that was another great experience. Um, I played some league cricket in England prior to that. Um, and then, yeah, I just got a phone call one day from James Whitaker, who was... Um, the um, high performance manager, I think you probably call it, at um, at Leicester, seeing if I was interested to go and play, and of course I jumped at the chance, um, you know, and played. Um, I played, ended up playing half a year there, and I unfortunately um, broke my cheekbone fielding in the slips, so oh. I had to. Um, that sort of ended my season because I couldn't play for eight weeks. Um, 
but yeah, I like, absolutely loved um, playing. You know, cricket. It was, it was a you know pretty different experience because you you're playing probably you know twelve twelve days out of fourteen. Um, particularly at the start of the year, all the one day career that was going on. So it's just cricket, cricket, cricket. So from a batting point of view, um, you know. I didn't go through a rut, which was handy, but, you know, because you're batting all the time, you feel, I felt really good and, um, you know, made some runs along the way. So I really enjoyed that aspect. It would have been interesting to see what it was like at the back end of the year. You sort of um, kept playing, whether the fatigue it would have set in or, or whatnot, or if you actually went through a rut and then you have to play every day, how, how you'd cope with that. But that was very different to what was happening in Australia at the time. We would probably have two weeks leading for each shield game so yeah I really enjoyed it loved the people um, got to play against some amazing um, players I think you know I played against Morley and Sakhain um, some really good spinners um, over there Andrew Flint off as well uh, yeah it was, it was an awesome experience would have, would have loved to have done it um, again and, and for younger players um, coming through um aspiring to play high level cricket uh, from a cricket learning point of view uh, is that that's the kind of thing you'd recommend to, to young guys if the opportunity comes up to get the chance to go and play on some different surfaces and um, master their game in different conditions yeah absolutely I think any any time you can play um, is better than training I think you know there's, there's obviously some um, really important stuff you can do in training but if you get the opportunity to play, um, to learn about yourself um, in different conditions, whether it be England, India, South Africa, wherever, um, you know, I think it's it's really important that you you take those opportunities um, as long as you're going with the right attitude. Um, you know, that you're going to still work hard when you're there and and, and learn. Uh, I think you know those experiences you, you can't buy. So um, I would recommend that to anyone. And I'm obviously, I'm obviously coaching now, and I'd certainly encourage people to. Um, and have done to go and experience that as well. Now you come back and um, time at Tasmania, you start to get some leadership opportunities at Tassie. Um, I'll talk about captaincy specifically in, in just a moment, but just wanted to talk about the 2004-05 ING Cup win for Tasmania. You're the captain of the team. You're up there playing against a a very strong Queensland team. I think Jimmy Ma might have actually been man of the match in that one. He he got a ton for them. And uh, the finisher, Michael Bevan and yourself, uh, finished things off a, a, a seven-wicket victory in the final. What are your recollections of winning the ING Cup and, and how much did that mean to you as captain and as leader of Tasmanian cricket in that game? Oh, it meant a lot. We didn't win a trophy... Um I think since the late seventies or early eighties, so we'd had a a very big drought in Tasmanian cricket, and we'd only won one trophy before. So for us to to create a bit of history, um, you know, to be part of that was was awesome. I guess that the season was an interesting one for us. We we started off on fire. I think we won our first four games, um, and then we really um, got into a rut, uh, you know, with our one day cricket. So we we struggled. We lost. Quite a few games, and I think Michael Bevan and Xavier Doherty um, got us over the line in a low-scoring game up in Devonport, um, which set us up for the final. And then um, I think we only qualified because um, New South Wales beat Victoria. I think Glenn McGrath destroyed Victoria in the game, and that meant we sort of fell into the final. But then on on final on the final day, um, I, I don't think we could have played any better. I think everyone. Um, played their role, um, you know, particularly well. I think Bevan was um, a key figure in that in terms of just, you know, teaching teaching a sort of youngish group with a couple of experienced heads how to, how to win tight games of cricket. And I think that getting over the line in that game, um, you know, was probably the catalyst to, um, you know, what was ahead for that, that group of players. Yeah, you mentioned what's ahead, the Sheffield Shield, the... Um, Pure Milk Cup, I think it was called back then as well. But um, yeah. 06, 07, that Shield final, a, a massive win against New South Wales. But it wasn't smooth sailing, the Shield final. You you win the toss, you have a bat. 
you make forty odd, but when when you're out, I think it was about seven for one eighty odd. Uh, can you talk us through a, again what that Sheffield Shield um, win meant to Tasmanian cricket? Yeah, I mean, once again, it's creating some history for us. So we we had a really good year, um, played some really good cricket all year, and you know, got ourselves in the position to host the final. So. I think we probably won six of the ten games um, with a couple of draws and maybe a couple of losses. But, um, yeah, so we, we obviously hosted the, the Shield final. Um, I won the toss and had a bat, which I thought I thought was going to be a, a really flat wicket. Um, but just underneath the surface, it was it was quite a tricky wicket um, on day one. And, you know, we lost a few wickets. Um, I think we might have been five for 80, then seven for one, 180, and then, um, Luke Butterworth and Damien Wright had a, a great partnership to get us um, to get us up to. I think we made about three twenty potentially, three, something 340, like that. Three forty, I reckon. Three forty. Um, yeah, so we got ourselves a good first inning score. By by no means did we think um, it was a great score, but we were definitely in the game. Uh, and then we bowled really well to, to to get New South Wales out for you know mid to low. 200. So we've set the game up nicely. All we've got to do now is bat well in the second inning. So I think we we collapsed again. I think we were, you know, in a similar five for 100, something like that. And then another great partnership from um, Butterworth and this time Klingliffer um, just took the game away from New South Wales. And we batted and batted and batted and, um, you know, got a lead over 500. And then um, we wrapped it up really quickly on the fifth day. Uh, we only, I think we only bowled 34 overs. Yeah, the New South Wales credit they they were going for the win, so they were going really hard, and uh, we took all our catches, and um, you know it, it ended up. I think we were celebrating about you know one thirty on on that Friday afternoon. I'll never forget it. Yeah, and um, as a captain, uh, a, a a mixture of players in the group, some experience, some youth, uh, some guys like Luke Butterworth, who you mentioned, he'd go on and win a couple more. Shields and and like I think he made his first class debut at the back end of that season, so it's early days for someone like him. And then you, you've got guys like Michael Divanudo who had a, a cracking season, just under a thousand runs for the season for him, and a, a Ben Hilfenhaus top of the the wicket taking charts uh, that year as well. Just all came together and just a really sweet victory. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was a good mix. Yeah, I think, as I said, Luke Butterworth, I think that was his fourth game. Um, you know, George Bailey was key in there. Uh, you know, Michael Divanudo, Michael Dighton had a really good year that year as well. Um, Tim Payne was opening the batting and wicket keeping. No, no, he, sorry, he did some wicket keeping throughout the season, but um, Sean Cunliffe came back into the side sort of with four or five games to go. Um, so Tim was opening the batting and Sean was wicket keeping. Uh, Hill for now, as you mentioned, was um, sensational. Adam Griffith came back late in the season um, to, to win his spot in the Shield final. Um, Damien Wright was had struggled with injury, and, and he once he too came back late in the season and had a real impact in the last few games. Uh, yeah, it was it was a good. I mean, by then we had a good, experienced team. Um, Travis Burt was was another one that played in that game. So um, certainly something that. You know, we as a group have celebrated. We had our 10 year anniversary, you know, a few years ago. We're, we're all looking forward to the, the 20th year one. Um, <laughs> I remember, I remember the last day, you know, vividly, you know, I'm not sure how many people came to Bell Reef, but people were just flooding in, um, to try and be there for, you know, when we wrapped it up. So by the time we finished, I, I don't know how many people were there, but there were, there was a good, a good crowd as I've seen at Bell Reef Oval, um, for a shield game. And it was just a very, special thing to share with with them but particularly you know the you know friends and family and and the organization who have waited so long for you know um you know to, to win a Sheffield Shield. Did, did you have a injury concern in the lead up to that game was that was that yeah. that year? Yeah so I did my calf in a one day game um against Victoria so I I think I missed the the Adelaide and New South Wales Shield games the last two yeah. Um, yeah. Just had to get through a fitness test to to play in the final, which I did. So you know, um, yeah, I would have been shattered if I'd have missed it. But um, yeah, lucky enough to get get myself in a position to to be selected for it. 
Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And and you go on, you have a you have a really good season personally. The following season, oh seven oh eight, uh, lots of runs, averaging over fifty. Um, win the I think it was the Ford Ranger Cup by that stage as well. Um, yep. The, the the captaincy role for you did you find that helped you to play better yourself were you did 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 you view yourself as a bit of a lead from the front kind of captain um not really I just enjoyed it I just enjoyed um you know the tactical side of the game so um I didn't see it so much as a, as a burden for me um yeah. just enjoyed you know and, and once again it's like as I said, with my bowling, it gives you, you know, um, another aspect to your game. So it made the days um, out there more enjoyable, being out of bat, bowl, captain. Um, yeah, it's something I really enjoyed. Um, you know, it's probably got a, for me, it probably had a, a life, you know, a five, I think it did it for five or six years, sort of, my, you know, by no Ponting was the captain, Um through a chunk of that time, but he obviously didn't play much. So I think I had five or six years. But when I was finished, I was ready to to move on from it. Um, but yeah, I really enjoyed it um, whilst I did it. Did Did you get to spend much time learning from the likes of of Ricky Ponting? Uh, you mentioned he was away a fair bit, obviously uh, with other responsibilities at the time in Australian cricket. But um, did anything from Ricky Ponting rub off on you the right way? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, hey, I played a fair bit with him when I first came down to Tassie. He was um, just breaking into the Australian team. So, you know, the first couple of years, played a lot with him, just saw how he went about things. Um, and then he would come back into our team for, you know, maybe one or two games a year um, around test cricket, one-day cricket, that sort of stuff. So, um, you know, I think he's someone who was just incredibly positive um, and everything he did, and unbelievable at um, connecting with people. Um, you know, when he was in our environment, he made everyone feel uh, feel special. And I reckon everyone, um, you know, ra- he raised the bar at training um, yeah. just by being there and, and you know having conversations with players uh, about their game, showing a genuine interest in them. And I think that's one of the things that. Um, and I think we're seeing a bit of that with his coaching uh, as well over in the, the IPL. I reckon he's the kind of guy that would just, like you say, raise the bar. Guys would want to get better because Ricky's in the same room. Um, it, just looking from afar, that's that that's kind of how I, I, I see. Uh, I can see him having a, a massive role uh, down the track there uh, in, in coaching. Yeah, I mean, there's just an aura about him when he walks in the room. I think... You know, it's something probably similar to Dennis Lilly when he walks in the room. I think most of <laughs> you know, people just, you know, stop and, you know, they want to listen to what they have to say. Now, you mentioned your broken cheekbone over in England. You, you did have other injuries and you had, I think one, I think it might have been 05, 06, you had a, a fair bit of time out of the game as well with injuries. What's it like for a professional athlete uh, when you are out on the sidelines and you're doing your rehab and you, you you really just want to be playing. How did you cope with injuries? Oh, I was pretty good. Um, I guess my injuries were, um, you know, I just worked out a timeline, you know, what, you know, from the get-go, it's like what, how long is this going to be? What do I have to do to get back? So I looked at it that way. Yeah. Um, so I just got stuck into the rehab knowing that, you know, there was going to be a time when I was going to be back. So that's not, not always the case for, for everyone. Um, you know, some injuries obviously linger on. You can't get to the the, the problem. But um, for me, that was how I dealt with it, right? I've got 12 weeks here. This is what I need to do. Let's go out and do it. Obviously, miss, miss playing. Um, but, you know, that, that was the way I approached it. So from a mental side of the game, I was, I was pretty, pretty good with it. Um, it didn't get me down too much. Oh, very good. Very good. And any advice to, to younger players that, that um, may go through a time where they can't can't play uh, to sort of keep themselves upbeat and positive? Yeah, I just think um, just understand they're going to happen. Everyone gets injured. You're not going to go 
have a long career without getting injured at some point. So it's going to happen to you. Um, it's not ideal, but yeah, for me, just get stuck into the rehab. Just do that properly. I think you know a lot of the stuff with the rehab is um, if, if you don't do it properly, you, it'll take longer. So just get stuck in your rehab, and then don't you know as best you can do. Um, just stay connected with the team. Um, yeah. You know, I just think yeah, when you that that can cause problems. I think if you disconnect with the team a little bit, so find a way. Drive you drive that to stay connected with the team, whether that's just informal catch-ups or just being at training, um, you know, just stuff like that. Just stay connected with the team and the time will go a lot quicker than you, you than you think. Now, um, your transition out of cricket, did you, or well, you're still in cricket, but tra- transition out of playing professional cricket, did, did you come to a point when you knew your time was up, so to speak? You, you knew it was time to, to hang up the boots? Uh, yeah, I, I did. Um, I I think the the la- before the last season I played, I started planning for the cr- um, life outside of cricket in terms of my coaching. So I didn't play T Twenty cricket in my last year. I um, I was lucky enough that I went away with our under seventeen boys and did some training with them and ran a batting program um, at cricket town. So I was certainly preparing for for life after and, and obviously want to get into coaching so that was my um, that was my plan I, I, mean, I would have kept playing forever but you know <laughs> that you know once you once you um, you can't play for Australia and you, I think I was 36 when I retired then yep. you know it's, it's almost um, the right thing to do is to, to let the, ne- the next crew come through so whilst I um yeah, you know, I knew it was the right time to go. I just wanted once I finished being captain, I just wanted to play one season more. Just when I wasn't the captain, um, tried to support George Bailey um, as a young captain, and then obviously from there just opt, opt out of the game. And I was lucky enough to to jump into coaching pretty much straight away. So uh, it was a pretty smooth and, and fortunate exit out of the game for me. And, and can you tell us a bit more about uh, what you're up to now and? Um what your future future plans are? Yep. Um, so at the moment, I'm involved um, with the Tassie uh, girls team, so the Hurricanes and the, the Tassie Tigers. Um, I've had three years doing that. Um, absolutely love it. Um, the girls have come a long way um, since um, Sal Beams and I have been coaching. It's, it's a program that's really... Um, it changed enormously. I think we didn't have much funding for the girls at all, um, and now they're they're running. We're running a you know fully um, fully fledged program. Uh, it's very professional, um, yeah, and we're really starting to see some really good improvements from the girls. So I've really really enjoyed that. Um, it's been challenging. It's had it, had its ups and downs, but um, it's good to see you know the girls growing um, and improving their games. Uh, and hopefully some success for for this group of players um, just around the corner. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And future plans, what do you see yourself doing in 10 years' time? You you still see yourself in and around the game? Uh, I'd like to be. Um, I really enjoy the coaching side of it, particularly um, you know, the coaching with the players, the one-on-one stuff. I think that's really um, something that really gets me out of bed each day to, to, to try and make you know each individual as good as they can be. Um, you know, I would have loved, and I hopefully still can. I'd love to do some coaching um, overseas, um, go and explore some other, um, a bit like playing, go and explore, explore yeah. some other environments. Um, you know, that, that's obviously been put on hold for a little bit um, with COVID, but uh, that's something I'd really like to do at some point in my life is to go and. Um, explore that and do some overseas stuff. Um, you know, this one of the great things with, um, with Cricket Australia is there's always opportunities to go and, you know, coach in A teams or, mm. you know, help out with, with some of the youth teams or whatever. So I've done a bit of that with, um, with the girls and the boys stuff and I really enjoyed that. That's just another way to go, and, you know, meet different coaches, meet different people, get into another environment. I think that's really important. Yeah. To keep, to keep developing as a coach. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. All those uh, things you can pick up 
um, ar- ar- around the traps. There's there's certainly more than one way of approaching things, and uh, sounds sounds like uh, it's been a, a really good transition for you down there in in Tassie. Now, before we go, I just need to ask you our this is our flagship question on on the podcast. We'd like to know if if Dan Marsh could have anyone. At the nets, uh, three people, living or dead, uh, don't have to be cricketers. Could be cricketers though. Um, who, who are you inviting down to the nets? God, um, well, one person I think would be I'd love to have played against is Pat Cummins. Yep. Um, you know, I think he seems like a terrific um, guy, but um, I watched him. Um, Bow was a 17 year old, and I thought this kid's going to be special. So I would love to face him, not not me currently now, but when I was a bit better, um, I lo- would have loved to have faced him at his prime. I reckon that would have been unbelievably challenging. Um, I I was lucky enough to play against Morley in England, but I'd love to to take him down in the nets and listen to him talk about the game. I think he was he was someone who. You know, just absolute cricket tragic. Um, knows uh, from what I hear, and he knows everything about what's going on in world cricket. Um, yeah. But then just talk to him about spin bowling, and um, you know, just get his thoughts around that. I think he he was you know pretty awesome. Um, and one other, um, he's. Um, no, probably from a cricket perspective, um, one person I never got to face um, was Glenn McGrath. Um, I played games against him, but never got to face face him in a game. So I would have loved to have that opportunity as well. Ah, oh, very good, very good. That'd be a net I'd enjoy uh, hanging around. Uh, Pat Cummins, Morley, and GD McGrath. That'd be absolutely outstanding. And do yeah, you reckon? I'm not sure I'm getting any more. It's the same again. I'm not sure I'm getting so many runs. <laughs> uh, you might get a few polls, though, if you're bowling to Glenn McGrath or Morley. Well, and, and Morley, yeah. yeah, that's yeah. Right. I might, that might be the way to go. Just <laughs> oh, well, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you, Dan. I really appreciate you sharing some of your story with our listeners and hopefully inspiring uh, more people to love and play the game and uh, really wish you all the best uh, with with your time coaching down there in Tassie and and your future goals uh, going forward. We really appreciate you jumping on for a chat. Thanks very much, Matt. A massive thanks to Dan Marsh for joining us on this edition of the Cricket Library podcast. What a wonderful story and a wonderful career. 139 first-class matches for Dan Marsh, over 7,500 runs, 168 wickets in there as well, if you don't mind. And lots to take out of that wonderful story of his and probably the highlight in there, that Sheffield Shield victory. So much goes into a Sheffield Shield season and for for Dan to have that opportunity to captain the team in the final, uh, a wonderful achievement and a wonderful memory. Entertaining net session that would be as well. Paddy Cummins, GD McGrath, Murali. I like the sound of that one, that's for sure. Well, if you enjoyed this chat, there are plenty more like it in the back catalogue. Most recently, we heard from Paul Adams, former South African spinner. And there's plenty, plenty of other stories in there. Kristen Beams, another bit of a Tasmanian connection. Maisie Gibson, another Tasmanian connection in there as well. Jamie Siddons, Tim Ludeman. The list goes on. Just check it out in your podcast feed and hit the subscribe button, go back and have a listen to some of those and keep your eye out in the coming weeks for the next edition of the Cricket Library podcast. This has been Matt Ellis. Bye for now.